So first, I want to welcome everybody to my home. Uh, this is not something I usually do, but somehow this year it seemed like the uh, a good and appropriate thing to do. You will occasionally hear my uh, solid world dog in the background. Um, I am a lover of dogs and have dogs in Second Life and in RL. Um, when I said I would do a presentation on um, urban gardening, urban farming, sustainable farming on a small scale, I didn't think about it being wintertime. And um, then I thought, you know, this is absolutely perfect because winter is the time that we plan our gardens. So welcome to my home in the Confederation of Democratic Simulators, the CDS. And uh, I have lived here in the Neue Freistadt Valley for 14 years now. So I've had a, a while to get my garden established. Um, and we have today here people from the science circle. We also have some of my friends and neighbors in the CDS around here. So if you have questions about this land, um, it is a residential community. We are um, self-governing. We elect our government officials and we've been doing that even longer than I've been a resident. So uh, of the people who are here, Rosie Gray, I know would be will perfectly willing to answer questions. Uh, Laurie, uh, Samara, or Kyoko would be glad to answer any questions that you would have about this whole area. <clears throat> so back to what I was saying about winter and the garden. Yeah, yeah, yes. It, it, it is a free city, yes, uh, with a constitution, the whole area. This is the oldest of the regions. So I guess it is an appropriate place for, for me to be living all these years. And before we start on the garden that is right here in front of us, um, you'll notice that there is a poster on the side of the barn here. And the poster is of a keyhole garden. And that was one of my first gardens in the Second Life. Uh, it was on the cozy, <coughs> excuse me, cozy shire, which is no longer in existence. And um, I started that one in 2006 before I came here, but uh, still had it there in 2008. So if you click that poster, you will find a little bit, a uh, no, note card with a little bit about keyhole gardens. And uh, they're wonderful for people with small spaces because they're circular and the compost and the, the that feeds the garden is right there in the center of the garden. So it's a very compact little thing. Um, I also put on that particular garden a rain catcher because it was inspired by some of the keyhole gardens in um, the drier parts of Africa where they don't get a lot of rain. And um, so the rain catcher collects the, the moisture, very simple thing to make, but it connects, it collects the moisture out of the air and drips onto the, the garden so that the, uh, the plants grow. So let's get back to here and why I wanted to do this in the first place. Um, a couple of months ago, I did a presentation um, on systems thinking and critical thinking and uh, the importance of 
systems thinking to sustainability for a um, regional UN conference. And I used the sustainable development goal number two, zero hunger, as one of my examples. And it got me thinking that if we are to have zero hunger, there's a lot of work that we need to do, not only from a community standpoint, from a national standpoint, from a world standpoint, but from an individual standpoint in understanding why this is so very important and what, what each of us can do so far as actions, but also so far as mindset and uh, questioning, the decisions that we make and the, um, the way we go about living our daily lives. So as I said, I've had the gardens here in Second Life Vegetable Gardens for 14 years, but much, much, much longer in our solid life. Um, I have been working on, <coughs> excuse me for a second, community gardens wherever I have lived for 35 years. So um, that was starting in the downtown areas in Boston. Um, and um, every place else that I have lived, and including where I am now in Western Massachusetts. And um, we are just about to start here on a pretty um, ambitious community garden, community farm on an unused land space close to where I live and engaging people who don't um, normally garden or who haven't gardened. So a lot of things have gotten me interested in doing this as a, a farm project in, um, in RL and not the least of which is that I was one of the founders of the local farmers market here about uh, eight years ago now. And I have a front yard vegetable garden because that's the south side of my RL um, property. And because I have a front yard garden, I have children walking by on the way to school. And the children would see me working in the garden and they didn't know what I was doing. So in the summertime <clears throat> or in the late, late, early summer, late spring, when we began to get tomatoes, I would hand them a cherry tomato and their eyes would wide, go wide like they had no idea that that is where food, their food came from, a garden. So I've, I've left every year some tomatoes um, where kids could pick them. And I have um, raspberry bushes that grow over the, the fence to the sidewalk. And I make sure that I leave some of the, the good raspberries there so kids can walk along the sidewalk and pick those too. So if we are raising children in our developed world who don't know where food comes from, it seems to me we are kind of missing the boat if we are going to get to the uh, sustainability goal of zero hunger. So, uh, moving back here, for a minute, as I said in the beginning, that winter is really a very important part of the gardening cycle. Um, and you notice the garden in front of me. So <clears throat> if people would really take a minute and look at it and look 
underneath and see what do you see there? What do you notice? What is it that you see first about the garden here? Because this very much uh, reflects what my RL garden looks like at the moment. Yeah, it's straw. It's not hay. So the difference between hay and straw is that hay has the seeds in it. So there is hay um, in a trough inside the barn. If you click the barn door, you'll see some in there. Um, these are pretty hardy sheep, but they do on occasion go into the barn if it is uh, very, very chilly or yeah, so there's there's straw and then the snow over top. But what else is there? Onions, yes. So you'll see here some root vegetables and some um, really cold weather vegetables that are still there. So, uh, for instance, if you look over in front of Scott, right where Scott's standing, you'll see some, some kale and a little bit of spinach. And they're buried in, in the straw. Kale doesn't mind the cold weather. You know, it's in a spot. I don't have a, um, a good... I have a better west facing sun than south facing sun. So the kale in the winter is in the corner there where it gets the best of both because if it freezes a little bit, you know, so what? It, it may get um, even frozen and then unfreeze and be usable. Yeah, most of the kale is, is that hardy. A lot of the cabbage is some of the um, uh, the collards. The other thing here that is right in front of me that is very hardy is parsley. And so parsley actually, to me, tastes better after it freezes, after the the weather goes below zero centigrade or uh, thirty two Fahrenheit the parsley gets sweeter. Yeah, the, the beets, um, the beet greens are not uh, freeze hardy, but the, if it's all covered with the, the straw, so long as you don't get a hard freeze all the way down um, into the ground, you'll have, um, you can still use the beets. Uh, so if you look hard, it, it you'll find beets and carrots and potatoes, um, radishes. They're still in the ground. Um, so kale will also come back. So it, if I leave it there, it'll be one of the very first to come back in, in the spring. Um, the parsley is, you, you have parsley for two years um, and it will reseed itself. Um, kale will reseed itself also. Um, the other unlikely plant that seems to reseed itself here in the Northeast where I am, uh, I'm in um, the Taconic Mountains in Western Massachusetts. So it gets pretty cold here, but the, the cherry tomatoes seem to have gotten themselves to be um, freeze hardy 
as well. And cherry tomatoes keep coming back, reseeding and coming back every, every year. Um, so that's one of the, the other things that I want to make sure to mention here. And, and that is um, to pay attention when we're growing food to pay attention to what is the, the, the nature-based way to do this. So that I, as I said, I am in the um, northwest part of Massachusetts in the northeast of the United States in the, the Taconic Mountains. And this is right on the edge of the Appalachian and the, uh, the, New England Piedmont regions so that it is soil that is overlies um, marble limestone a lot of limestone um, it's not thick soil but it's good soil and knowing your soil is the very first important piece of gardening so um, if you have a garden and you haven't had your soil tested, it's a good idea to do this. Most of the universities that uh, were originally land grant universities will do this for either free or a very small cost. Um, No, uh, Shiloh, it's not that one is better than the other. It is knowing the soil that you have so that you begin to plant things that will be, um, will like where you put them. Um, one of the reasons that we have depleted the soil around the world is um, not only because we want to get higher yields for for the soil and, and over fertilize, but also because we're not, um, we're not paying attention to what would grow well, what would like living in this particular soil. And yeah, I plant garlic in September, but I also have some um, cloves in the house in a little bit of water and uh, then in a, a pot so that I can cut the greens. Um, yeah, so the, the P, when I was talking tagline about testing the soil, you want to have um, know what the soil is in regard to what the plant likes so that the leafy greens like the soil that is a little bit more alkaline and the tomatoes like the soil that is a little bit more um, acid. And, and so uh, learning what the plants that you want to eat like um, is a real important part of gardening. So don't plant something, two plants next to each other that don't like the same um, the same kind of soil. And that's the other advantage of doing the, the no-till or the, um, which I've done always, or uh, planting into the, the uh, straw. Yeah, the, all right, the nitrogen fixing bacteria it's not just that uh, Baragon. It, you have, oh, and I should mention, and I didn't mention this before, um, over by the other side of the barn, right in front of the barn, uh, right behind Nexus there is a little box and it has some of the, a, a list of resources. It's certainly not all of the resources, but there's a note card in there with, with some resources, but there are, uh, not only bacteria, there are um, um, fungi and uh, um, different microbes here in the, the soil that 
plants need in order to be healthy. Um, and I'm skipping around a little bit, but it, it brings up another piece here. And, and that is, it's not only the, the uh, yeah, all of those, um, plus you know, animals that dig in. Um, but the starting with healthy soil is, is critical for sustainable food. Um, it means not only that your the food that you grow initially is better quality and more nutritious, but it's also that the seeds are going to be better seeds for germinating. So that if you want to have a um, a sustainable garden, the things take care of your soil. Um, plant things that you like to eat. Don't plant. Don't bother plant something that is maybe looking good but you don't eat that that really is a, a waste of the resources um, and uh, then make sure that you rejuvenate the soil so i'm not a big believer in fertilizer or um, certainly not heavy fertilizer by any means um, biochar added to the soil will make it a little bit more acid um, and if you need to do that, that's a good thing. Uh, and composting. If you look behind um, Edgar there, there is a compost pile. Uh, my RL compost pile looks different than that, but it is still something that I use all the time. And that's because if you're going to put have healthy soil, you want to put the, the nutrients back into the soil. We eat, but then they, it never, what never gets replenished is the soil in um, the areas where the food was grown that we eat. So if I am eating strawberries from Mexico, for instance, I am virtually using the Mexican water and all of the soil nutrients because the nutrients, whatever is left over, is going to get deposited in Western Massachusetts and not in Mexico. Um, this, on the long term of sustainability, doesn't make a whole lot of sense on a, a broad scale. Um, so, Soil first, then plants, and, and I do organic gardening. Now on that list is the seed company that I use, but that is for the Northeast of the United States. That a high mowing organic seeds is in Vermont. Um, so if, if you're looking for seeds, look for seeds that are grown, uh, produced in the area where you live. So if you're in California, you want to look for uh, seeds. Not all organic seeds are heritage seeds, um, Shiloh. Some are, some aren't. Um, that, that's as much a matter of preference. Uh, sometimes heritage seeds are better suited to the land, but not always. Ah, I, I'm sorry that see did not get the voice. But anyway, um, so soil, then plants, and then care. Um, I also don't use pesticides um, or very, very little of the pesticides. And if that is so, um, only ones that are natural and um, decompose. So that if you've done the planting well, and I do some companion planting, not only for the, the pests, but for the adapting to the seasons, um, and then the, 
you, you think of pests like um, slugs and stuff, but there's, I also have a woodchuck a, uh, that lives in the area. And so I have had to plant mint around the kale because the woodchuck doesn't like the mint. So yeah, marigolds some, uh, in tomatoes, if you, if you plant the marigolds around the tomatoes, that will discourage. So to a limited way, I do the um, companion planting. Yeah, chickens ab absolutely help. Now in RL, I don't have chickens. Here I do have chickens. Uh, you notice I have a chicken coop over there and chickens that uh, wander around here. And um, Geo, the very active, friendly dog, makes sure that the chickens stay alive and that uh, no foxes or raccoons or uh, come and eat the chickens. So I guess the, the most important thing here from a gardening and a scientific uh, perspective is to figure out for your area, what is the, what would be nature's way? And, and I'm not a purist on um, what might be an invasive species. Um, because we're all migrants. Every single one of us and every single plant around over time has migrated somewhere from somewhere. So, <clears throat> but I, I am very much um, concerned with the balance and, <clears throat> and how nature would balance things out so that as I said, for instance, I don't use the, the pesticides, um, but I do take care to make sure that, you know, things don't get eaten um, by everyone but me. So that, for instance, with tomatoes, uh, if you have an area where you have cutworms, plant the tomato um, seed or the, the plant with a, a a uh, cup or a a um, a cuff below the ground and then oh about two inches above, so that the cutworms can't get in there. Um, yeah, uh, probably the the best uh, one of the most effective um, things for deer is not only put things around the plant that they don't like, but also if you can get uh, coyote urine, for instance, um, they tend not to want to be there. So I do have a problem with uh, snails and slugs. And one of the things that I do for that is to put out a, um, a very shallow bowl and put it in the ground to the point where the lip of the bowl is about level with the um, with the ground and put beer in it. You could use milk. I've I've used beer. Um, the like humans, the slugs and the snails are attracted to the beer and. Uh, so they, they will go for that instead of the, uh, the kale and the, uh, the collards. The, the slugs seem to like the beer. So, yeah, <laughs> so they actually drown in the beer, but yes, it attracts them. Yeah, they do drown, yeah. So the, the things that I have that I grow because it's what works in my area because we have the very cold and uh, then relatively hot summers, not brutally hot summers, but hot summers. So I grow a lot of the brassicas. I grow kales 
and uh, cabbage and collards and mustards and bok choy and radishes. Um, and um, those are probably th good three and a half season plants for me. In the very hot weather, I will put down uh, either a, a shade cover for the kale or make sure that they are shaded in some way because they, kale and spinach do, do not like very hot weather. The kale, the spinach will bolt. You know, it will go to flower almost immediately. Um, lettuces don't like really hot weather either. So those are early planting for me as soon as I can put them in the ground. Yeah, the Swiss chard is also a good three season plant for me. Um, and then I do a very a variety of, of tomatoes. Some are hybrids, some are heirloom. Um, peppers, tomatillos, um, peas and beans. Peas I also put in the ground just as early as I can stick my finger in the ground. They also do not mind cold and they hate hot. They will, they will wilt in the hot weather. Um, my, my area seems to be really good for peas. And, uh, beans come after the peas on, on the same, um, I, I do stake them. I have onions, garlics, chives of various kinds. And then I do squashes and cucumbers. Um, I also plant for a little bit of color, I plant the nasturtium. And nasturtium is edible. So I use the flowers in, in salads. Makes a, a lovely salad with a little bit of, uh, garlic chive and lettuce and uh, a couple of tomatoes and some, some nasturtiums, beautiful salad. Um, and then I have uh, a lot of different herbs because I use them a lot too. I have oregano and oregano doesn't mind the cold weather. I, I can, right now I have snow on the ground. I can reach under the snow and um, pick a little bit of the oregano and it's perfectly good to use. Um, so I have oregano, basil is very temperature sensitive. So that comes in the house. I have sage, rosemary, I have uh, regular peppermint and I have chocolate mint. I have lemon balm, thyme, tarragon. Tarragon in my area grows like a weed parsley, uh, summer savory, and lavender. Now, some of those can be used um, for medicinal purposes as well. And the uh, so rosemary, where I am, has to come in the house. Right now, my rosemary plant is right next to my desk in the office so that it does get some, some sunlight still. Uh, it won't grow much over the winter. Uh, and it doesn't like a lot of water in the winter, but it should be just fine to go out in, in the, the late spring again. Um, what I didn't mention, and if you'll look around, you'll see, are berries. So you notice I have bushes here and trees. Um, you because this particular region here where we are in Second Life is a, uh, a Alpine European um, inspired region. It's, it's not by any means a role play region, but it is inspired by Alpine areas. Uh, in RL, I have blueberries. Here I have uh, the slow berries and they're right along the, the side there. Um, it 
we, we've tried to keep some of this uh, you know, close to what it would be in feel as you would in a, an alpine region in RL. Um, I don't have gooseberries. I have currants in RL. Uh, I also have, I do have the blueberries. I have currants. I have a number of different kinds of raspberries. Um, and then if you look down closer to my house here, I have elderberry. Uh, I have elderberry in RL as well. Now, you only see one plant there, but if you down further behind the house, there is a second elderberry. Um, that's because to pollinate, there needs to be two of them, at least. So um, many of the plants don't care, but elderberries do. Apples do also. So you'll notice that there are uh, two apple trees here in the yard, but up on the hill, not on my property here, there are more apple trees. So apple trees need to be cross-pollinated. Um, uh, on my RL land, uh, I have four different kinds of apples. And we were asking about heritage plants. Uh, two of them, two of my apple trees are heritage trees. My uh, Baldwin is first came to the United States of, or was made grafted in, uh, in the United States in the early 1800s. And the um, one in the backyard is a Roxbury russet. And that was put, brought or um, developed in the United States in the 1600s. Um, so the, the Roxbury russet looks um, a lot like a, a pear, actually. Um, and it's got that uh, rough russet skin. Uh, very, very sweet, very tasty. And then I have uh, one ancient tree that was this behind the garage here and uh, very... I don't even know what what version it is, but it is uh, it helps for the pollination. And in the front yard, I have uh, a very new variety, and it is in the front yard vegetable garden, and that is a a northern pole apple. And so it is uh, vertical. It has branches that do not go out very far, and all of the apples are clustered right near the trunk of the tree. So that, that's kind of an experiment for me. But again, I, I grow what I like to eat. And so in the mornings, in the summer, you'll find me, and I get two crops of raspberries off the, uh, off the, the bushes that I have. So I get raspberries most of the summer. And I get the apples starting in mid to late August. Yeah, most of the apples are trees in, in the United States are uh, splinting or grafting or, um, but yes. Uh, what kinds of squash do I, I do? I do a number of kinds of cucumbers. I do the summer squash, the zucchini, um, and I do some of the um, some winter squash, but not a lot. I do a little bit of uh, acorn squash and uh, a little bit of delicata. And I have a small plot. I don't have that, that winter squash, yes. So, um, my elderberries are, I have bought the two elderberries that I have from a farmer that I know well, uh, who does also organic farming. And she uh, has grown them from, from stock. 
so they're not they're not natural here uh, they weren't wild um, but I, I I do want to get a little bit to the wild here and because I was talking about uh, in fact a lot of people are talking about rewilding and and while that's important to give land back to what of ever uh, non-cultivated um, land that we can and let nature do the design. I also don't have grass like other people have grass. Um, we decided that we would let that go pretty natural. And even though we cut it some, we have things that have um, volunteered themselves. So, and, and you'll see that here in the summertime, I have dandelions. Um, and dandelions are native to my area. Uh, I do eat the, we eat the dandelion greens. They're, they're wonderful early in the season. The, the young, young dandelion leaves are excellent. Um, I, we also eat the flowers. We, I do not make dandelion wine. But yeah, that, that's the thing that I was going to say, tagline. They are the first uh, source of nectar for bees in my area. And I don't have beehives in RL. My, my grandfather did have beehives. I do have a beehive here, but it's too cold to have the beehive out. So um, be, bees don't want to be out in the snow. Uh, but and if you come by here in the summer, you will see the dandelions in the grass and you will see the bees floating around, flying around. So um, so I do have dandelions. I do have curly dock. Curly dock is a native of Europe, um, but it has naturalized here in the US and it is sped, spread all around. I use those leaves too. I s let those go to seed, share the seed with the the um, birds, but I also use some of the seeds and uh, and I have taken the roots of the curly dock and um, cooked those and made a really excellent Asian dish that I learned from a Korean friend. Um, I have goldenrod, which the birds love, but um, Dong likes the bird, the golden rod too. He eats the leaves. Ramps are native to my area. So ramps are in the um, onion family, but they are a uh, endangered. So I just cut the leaves and use the leaves and not all of the leaves out of the plant. Um, just some of the leaves on every plant, but they, they do grow wild in the, in the woods um, and on, in the woods inside of my land um, and use that to make pesto. Uh, purslane is in my yard also. I use that sparingly. Some people love purslane. I'm not wild about it. Um, and violets, the, the, Blue violets are native to my area and they are all over my yard. They're also edible and I use the, the leaves and I put the flowers into salads. Um, again, uh, I was going to say that the nasturtiums taste quite a bit like cucumbers, but the, the violets have, I don't know, more of a, a savory flavor to me. And uh, if you look around here, you'll see on the sides in the woods, ferns. Uh, I have ferns in RL too. Yeah, you can eat the violets. Um, I, I don't know about the roots of the violets, but the leaves and the flowers you can eat. But here you'll see ferns that are um, either dead or dying. I have ferns in my RL. Uh, yard also. You can cut the fiddleheads. Again, do not cut 
all of it or you will kill the plant but take some of the the fiddleheads um, and they you know, steam them like you would green beans and they have a lot of uh, taste like that you know tagline if you ate a lot of anything you'd probably get overwhelmed but if i put violets as the um the garnish in a salad it's fine it's fine so um there's a lot more to say here but i'm watching the time and i want to get to the the back to the, the little greenhouse area in the back but before we leave this area does it do anybody people have any other questions about this and, and I do invite people to come back over the the year because this is a uh, seasonal uh, region and it will change in the spring and the summer and the fall uh, and I changed the garden along with that. Um, I have started growing a little bit of um, of tomatoes uh, and potatoes, but not a lot where I am now. This is not the purpose of this sim is not to educate, but that is certainly my purpose. <laughs> yeah, so uh, it it is part of what I do in Second Life and in uh, the solid world. But, yeah, and, and we certainly do have educational programs here, but we also have just fun programs too as well. So let's take a walk into the next parcel. It may be that the, the voice will take a minute to get itself um, settled in. But if you walk, pay attention to what else is around here. Oh, somebody mentioned the medicinals. If you look to my left here, you'll see witch hazel, which is definitely used as a medicinal. and rose hips also. So the ice should be solid enough to stand on. We're not, this is a very small all tight place. So this is the south side of my house. This is the area that gets the most sun. Um, and so this is where I put the attached greenhouse to my house. You'll notice that there are two trees here. So in the summertime, they will leaf out and they will uh, cool the the greenhouse area a little bit because I still do use it some in the summertime. Um, oh, and I might mention that now to my left on the other side of the stream is a willow and willows are used to some degree um, medicinally too by different peoples. But take a look inside the greenhouse. See, I've moved all, yeah, you can have willow tea. Um, there's a little bit of uh, uh, similar to aspirin in the willows as well. Um, I've moved all of my herbs inside. In RL, I have them scattered around my house. Here, I have them all in one place. Um, I also have here in my greenhouse a pot of violets so that I can use those for, um, for my salads. I have 
a hanging nasturtium plant. So I will use those too. I've started some uh, lettuces in um, my animals don't eat the well that's not entirely true Micah my dog would eat some of them if they were down where he could reach them um, but he he would take a little bit of the the basil but it's hanging up so he can't yeah um, here and I am trying this now in RL as well and it's not something I've done before but you'll notice in the um, planter next to the the lettuce uh, which Micah absolutely would eat he, he I have a semi vegetarian dog by choice he his choice and he loves lettuce he loves cabbage um, so he would definitely eat that uh, but I have the chard growing and um, inside and now I, I must say in RL, I don't have this kind of a greenhouse, but I have a, a long, thin front vestibule where I put shells along the windows and that's south facing and east facing. And I have the, um, the window boxes with lettuce and chard and kale in, the, um, in that area to grow for the winter. Um, but as I am gonna say here, and I'm starting to try this in, yeah, I add eggshells to the soil, definitely. Uh, crumble them and add them to the soil. That makes it so that uh, the slugs and snails don't wanna walk over it, but it also adds the nutrition back into the soil. And the ones I don't put in the, the soil directly, I do compost, yes, tagline. I do, I put those in my compost. But here, I'm going to try planting some little seedlings in, in the egg shell cups and see how that works. Um, and that, that's gonna be um, an interesting um, experiment for me this winter. Um, now, if you look on the other side here, right in front of the, uh, the shelves with the herbs you'll see sitting in water the uh, bottom the top parts of carrots i don't have as many of these in rl but i do have them and they are on my kitchen table and so i uh, am growing the tops from the carrots that i cooked and used in soup and um i will when I have enough of the tops, I will make uh, pesto again with the carrot tops. So I have a, a good goat cheese and the, the carrot tops makes a wonderful pesto. Yeah, yeah, I do. I eat the, t I make pesto out of the tops, Max. So I, I have a goat cheese that is, I don't know, it's sort of, it's not a cheddar, of course, but it, it's sort of that kind of a flavor, and it mixes very well with uh, the flavor of the carrot tops. Yeah. So I, I use, uh, I'm, I may try also because I'm growing the um, radish leaves from the, uh, from the bottom, the tops of the radishes. So I'm, I'm doing that as well. Um, and I'll use the leaves. I'll try that in, in pesto and maybe put a few walnuts or something in that as well. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm so lucky in the area where I live. It's a tiny city and lots of small farms around. So I can go to the farm that makes the goat cheese. I can go to the farm that makes the sheep cheese. Um, and uh, I can go to the farm, the dairy, the cow farm to get my half and half. Um, and I, I'm really lucky. I do not have chickens in RL, but I know 
Um, I have some very good friends who do have chickens, and uh, so I get eggs, fresh eggs from them. Uh, I, I'm just really lucky in, in what I can do where I live. I don't know if it will work. I'm trying it here, but I'm also going to try it in RL to start tomatoes earlier uh, and start them inside in one of the window boxes. Yeah, the yeah, they they uh, and and see if I can start my tomatoes early because in where I live, I can't put tomato plants in the ground until after until the beginning of June. Um, it just it it gets too cold. Yeah. 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 Ursa, I do that too. I put coffee grounds. I I, I get, I really am a, an organic gardener and I get organic coffee and I put my organic coffee grounds into the compost. Yes. Yeah. Um, so yes. And here, and I'm trying this in RL as well. If you notice, I have a grow light on the, the ceiling here, and I put a grow light now into my front vestibule because I don't get eight hours of sun in there uh, in the winter time. And I know I can't grow the uh, tomatoes unless I have that. So I will probably try starting the tomatoes inside in March and see if that works because I'm going to have more sun and uh, um, and I'll let you know whether I can, whether this is a working thing. Um, the last thing that I want to point out here as well, if you notice on the, on right by the, the inside door here, you'll see a little plant in a, a test tube hanging on the, um, the, the wall. So that is regrowing and I, I can do mint and um, oregano that way in, inside. And then you'll notice on my little gardening table, there is an avocado starting to grow, um, but it's not just avocados that you can do that way. And there are some um, resources in the note card that I, I provided on other things that can be grown like that little avocado seed is being grown here. Um, yeah, back to what we're asking about the chickens and horses and all. Uh, I get my straw from a farmer who is also a good friend and uh, she has chickens and horses so that it is, yes, it is in, in the straw. Um, Tomatoes like manure. They really like manure. So, yes. So that's a good thing. Um, you're, you're welcome to go inside and, and look around. Uh, I also, as I said, yeah, the, I, I don't, I don't use, it will burn the, the roots of the plants, Sumo, if you use it when it's new. The manure, yeah, yeah. So you do want it to age a little bit. Um, inside here on the stove, you will see soup cooking. I in RL, I make soup all winter, um, and so this very much mimics, uh, though it's not identical, but it mimics uh, what I do in in RL. Yes. Uh, Ursa, I, I have not had that as a problem. Um, I, I get uh, the straw, where I get the straw, they are also organic gardeners. So I have not had to deal with that. Yes. Yeah. 
I have used a, a rooting compound, yes. Uh, I couldn't tell you the name of it right now because I can't reach it. It's in the back vestibule. Yes. Um, I. That's the other thing. Um, speaking about the the some of the toxicity in some of the uh, compost and all, you want to be careful. And that's the other reason to get your soil tested ahead of time, and know the farmers. One of the things we. One of the goals in setting up our. Uh, local farmers market was that we wanted a farmer producer market so that people could get to know the the farmers themselves and ask those particular questions of the farmers how things were grown um, and you know, express their desires to the farmers so that the people who are eating the food and the farmers who are growing the food are all on the same page so I guess what I want to leave people with here is we are not going to grow all of our food. I'm not going to grow all of the food I eat. But in growing the food, some of the food that I eat, I am much better at asking questions and recognizing the how food is grown um, what are the pluses and minuses and um, to encourage people all around to take a scientific nature-based um, perspective on growing and eating food. So um, that is one of the things that I, I absolutely want to spread around. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, Mike, that, yeah, notice that I have an, an olive, olive plant on the, the table, uh, not too far from the stove. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, the aloe plant that I have in my RL home was grown by uh, – girls in in a private school near me in their uh their gardening and nature class yes so i'll be glad to answer questions um and also i i know that um i or anybody else would be glad to answer questions about these these six regions um rosie wood for sure uh, as well, but we'll be, and, and explore the whole area. I mean, this is, uh, as I said, it's six residential regions and uh, uh, a very, very nice, friendly community. And uh, Kyoko Samara, who just popped back in, is our chancellor for this six month term and Rosie is, was chancellor for our last six month term. We are now on our 34th term of government. So, yes. Yeah. I'm glad everybody enjoyed this. Uh, each term of government here in the CDS is six months. It goes from December 1st to um, and then the next one starts June 1st, year after year. <laughs> no faceless electors, no. <laughs> No. Oh, I'm really glad. I'm really glad people have enjoyed it. And now you have a landmark. You're welcome to, uh, to come back and check it out anytime.
do make sure though that you you stop and say hello to the dogs they'll get very offended if they don't get attention <laughs> oh and and when somebody asked about horses there are usually two horses that live here in this uh in the pasture i uh, farmed them out to a, a friend's lot for for today because um they would have gotten in the way of people standing but if you come back you will find two horses yeah Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, this is good. This has been fun. This has been fun. And and you're very welcome. And I I wish everybody a uh, a wonderful holiday season. <laughs>